and welcome to Metaphorically Speaking with me, Delia Delore, the radio show and podcast where we walk and talk our way through popular mottos, mantras and metaphors, tracing their roots and finding how they fall into place with everyday life. Each week we have a special guest who resonates with their chosen expression. I love this week's metaphor as I've heard it many times. But a strange thing happened when doing the show today. I was going through my phone trying to delete some pictures. You know what it's like when this storage thing pops up. So, okay, uh, I went to the section where there were people so I could see if there was anyone that I wanted to delete for whatever reason. I don't know why I went to people, but I went there. And guess what I saw? I saw that it identified myself and my daughter in the same box that said Delia. So they put some of her pictures onto mine. And the most fascinating one I saw was one of me when I must have been around eight or something. And it pulled out the picture of me being eight and my daughter looking the way she is right now and called her Delia. I couldn't believe it. I had to send it to her and she was shocked. So she put it on her Facebook page just to show that it actually identified my young face as her older face. And I'm wondering whether you've worked out what our metaphor is this week. Because you know, sometimes I talk about the metaphor in the beginning without saying what it is. Well, while you're mulling it over, let me remind you that the use of a metaphor is to create a comparison of two separate entities. Usually, these entities have their own distinguishable or parallel qualities. And the comparison is to find a common ground when you're comparing two different things to show a similarity. And that's the roundabout way of saying it. But if you think of how I was comparing myself with my daughter and vice versa, maybe you're getting closer to knowing what the metaphor is. Although I just gave you the definition of a metaphor, we will be looking at an idiom on this week's episode. Now, you might be asking yourself, why the explanation? Well, it's because the idiom that we're going to delve deep into is actually used to make a comparison of two separate people, usually a child to their parents, in the sense that they show characteristics similar to them. Okay, you must have guessed the metaphor now. It's the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, for mother and daughter, we certainly don't have a lot in common. Maybe more than you think. <laughs> think about it. I hate Mr. Whipple. God, me too. Mm. I hate growing older. Boy, am I with you. You don't have to be a professor to see the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. The first time the idiom is thought to be used in the English language was by a man named Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1839 whilst writing a letter to his Aunt Mary. His exact words were, the apple does not fall far from the stem, which is close enough. However, this was the first time the phrase was used in English. Emerson did not use it to compare a parent to their child or vice versa. He was referring to the way we always return to our childhood home in some way or another. The context of his letter is unknown, but it does give the sense of having that metaphorical route leading back to your past. You could say the apple hasn't fell far from the tree. The term we know and use today started being used just over a century later in the book Body, Boots and Britches by H.W. Thompson. This is a book that tells about authentic America, New York folklore. Americans, however, were not the first to use the saying. In the 1500s, there was a German phrase, Der Apfel fällt nicht gerne weit vom Baume, which roughly translates to The apple does not like to fall far from the tree. This may be the first known use of the phrase, but it's still uncertain where the first apple of the tree fell from. We do know that they do all describe a relationship to or with family. And there's also a very cheery German song called Der Apfel fällt nicht weit vom Stamm, which Nick McKenzie translated to The apple doesn't like to be felled far from the tree. <laughs> Mein Sohn, wirst du dein Herz verschenken? Dann solltest du immer daran denken. Der Apfel fällt nicht weit vom Stamm, darum sei ein kluger Mann 
und schau dir erst die Mutter an. Hat sie Haare auf den Zähnen, dann bringt das Leben für dich viel Tränen. Der Apfel fällt wie Wald vom Stamm, darum sei ein kluger Mann. Und schau dir erst die Mutter an. Na, na, na. Let's look closely at the phrase itself. There are many connotations when the mind wanders. Who knows what you may associate the saying with? Or the obvious may come to mind. Apples denote knowledge, love, wisdom, joy, death, and even luxury. Trees are linked to family, shelter, and also love and wisdom, just like apples. I want you to think of an apple. Think of its color. Think of its shape. Is it big? Is it small? Does it have little white dots? Is there a leaf on its stem? Is there a shade of green coming through red? Or is the apple just barely visible to you? These questions are part of a psychological study that circulated on social media a few years back. The study was to determine if you have or have not got a creative brain. And the test came about after online users started asking the question, does everyone have an internal monologue? Creativity is something you can inherently adopt from your parents, yet in some cases you can be extremely creative without your parents even being creative at all. It really makes you wonder where this spark of imagination and creativity really comes from, if it's just a 50-50 chance you adopt it from your parents. People who can conceptualize things in their head aren't able to see a clear image when they close their eyes. This experience is actually a condition called aphantasia. Here's a clip of people who have this mental variation explaining what it's like to live with aphantasia. I live my life in facts. It's entirely knowledge-based. I still create concepts in my mind and I still have ideas. In the same way that I might know the start and end of the Second World War, I also know that I did this on this day. Occasionally, aphantasia results from brain injury or psychiatric disorder. But the great majority of people who've been in touch with us have lifelong aphantasia and have lived with it very successfully and contentedly and productively. The frequency of aphantasia is around 1%. I found out about two years ago. When I first found out, it was a shock. Always considered myself as being a little bit different. I don't have a visual component to my imagination. I'm empty inside my head. Even if I close my eyes, I see black. The memory is not in pictorial form. I never knew people saw it differently. So you might assume that aphantasia is disadvantageous. There are also strengths. People with aphantasia can be a little more present and they're less prone to regret, longing and craving. In keeping with that, I don't think aphantasia is a disorder or a condition. It's more of an intriguing variation in human experience. The name aphantasia was birthed by Adam Zeman. Zeman is a professor who has conducted research about the mind's eye, which was previously philosophized by Aristotle. In fact, you heard him in the previous audio clip. Aphantasia is characterized by a lack of functioning mind's eye, which leads to an inability to visualize things mentally. The Apple test confused a great deal of people who took part as it raised questions about the way we dream, such as the different kinds of effects aphantasia may cause if people can only dream in feelings as opposed to images and feelings. Our very talented guest on this episode of Metaphorically Speaking is Alison Knowles. Alison is not only the author of the Ollie and his Superpower series, she's a fantastic public speaker and an award-winning neuro-linguistic psychotherapy trainer. She has taken all these skills to develop programs for children to help them regulate their emotions. With such a wheelhouse of talents, we think that she might have some superpowers of her own. <music> Alison, it's wonderful to see you. I, I don't know why, but every time I see you like this, I feel as if I know you, like we've been in the same room together. And the fact is, we haven't really. No, I'm waiting for the invite to St Lucia to set Ollie up out there. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ollie would have a wonderful time. He'd get a lovely tan. <laughs> oh, <with> Ali, yeah. <laughs> Well, since the last time we've we've spoken, I have uh, been following you all over the place and you've been doing some wonderful things. So please tell us about you and also about Ollie. 
Well, firstly, thank you. You've been an amazing supporter from the off. So I really, really appreciate you for that. We've just gone from strength to strength. We have our own school now. So I train therapists, not people with degrees, mums and dads. And my thing is, if you can tell me why, I'll teach you how. We're in schools all over the place, foster and adoption. We get called in to work with kids everyone's given up on, which suits me because that's what I wanted to do. But now also we're doing prevention work. So we're getting to the kids before there's a problem. I've got six-year-olds that love the idea they have anxiety because they know that anxiety is just their little bodyguard and he doesn't know they're six now. He still thinks they're two and they don't know what to do. Wow. Well, for for listeners who don't know about you, elaborate on what it is you actually do. I can't read and write very well. I just I've just won an award, a diversity award, which suits me down to the ground, Mm -hmm. except it was for role models. Some people might question that. I'm a therapist. I train in all sorts of therapy, but I didn't really like any of them because they put people in boxes. And if you if you had anxiety, I had to turn to page 32. And if it didn't sort you out, it was your fault, not me as a therapist. And I thought, that's wrong, isn't it? So I just simplified it all and came up with a way of all of us dealing with our emotions. What is an emotion? You can't touch it, feel it. So I made them little people that live in us. Can I just say, before Inside Out did, Disney, mm, right? I was there first. Mm. And what we do is we literally talk to that part of you rather than the whole. Because when you're really anxious, it just takes over, doesn't it? You can't see your way out of the woods. By pulling the part out and just saying, okay, what's going wrong? We've got kids, teens, adults being able to look at it from a perspective and go, ah, right, okay, yeah, this is what we can do about that. And they're solving their own problems. So then they're not in therapy for months and months and months and months, which does nobody any good apart from the therapist's bank account. And they feel better about themselves and they can take what I've taught them, if it was on anxiety, and use it for anything, for grief, for anger. And what it means is they're not in therapy forever. They don't have to wait months to see a therapist. And they're going to grow up into adults that know how to do this and teach their kids how to do it. And that's how we stop the madness of mental health that's happening in this country. We're giving them the tools, but in a really simple way. And it's so simple, I feel daft talking about it, but we're winning awards. We ran an award in education last year. It's like, Mm -hmm. we're just having fun. But, you know, anxiety is something that many people refuse to admit that they're suffering from it. And I would say everybody I know in all the world, I think each and every one of us have suffered it at one point or another. And now, of course, we've had this pandemic and that's kind of brought it up a little bit more, forced to face it. Have you found that? Honestly, you know, we're probably one of the professions that has done, it's an awful thing to say, but done well out of the pandemic because everybody is so stressed and we all have different reasons to be anxious. Being sick, do I go out? Do I stay in? I'm a frontline worker. Mum's a frontline worker. You know, a grandma and grandpa safe. What anxiety is, it's the body's way of saying something's not right and you might be in danger. Now, it only knows that because it's experienced it before. Well, none of us have experienced COVID but we probably all experience not being in control or feeling helpless. So that's the anxiety we're actually feeling. But the truth is, it's not a bad thing. If you think about it like an internal bodyguard, just a small part of you. And his job is just to circle around you your whole life and go, oh, last time that happened, it wasn't good. Last time that happened, it wasn't good. I'm going to make you anxious Mm -hmm. so that you go into fight or flight response and you run away or you fight it. Problem Mm -hmm. is you can't fight an emotion. And that's the thing that's scaring most of us. This is what we do, and it's that simple. You can do it yourself. Anxiety is a part of you. Something's frightened it, but it can only be frightened if it's experienced it before. That's the key. It didn't experience it last week, last year. Cliche as it is, it experienced it when you were a lot younger. It's not It's not anxious about COVID. It's anxious about something connected. Helplessness, loss. And it's connecting it to something that you learned when you were a lot younger. And what we do, and the easiest way to interrupt that is to say, thank you, little bodyguard. But, you know, I'm now, I'm going to say 21, plus, 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 plus. <laughs> and I've got a few more skills. And, do you know, yeah, it's not a good situation, but falling apart isn't going to help me. So I appreciate that you're worried for me. But I've got a lot more skills now. I'm older. You think of anxiety as just a mental thing. But I know, because I've experienced this firsthand, where I just have not felt well. And I just think... Well, there must be something wrong. I need to check my heart. So, but you don't, it's it's actually anxiety, but you, there's nothing wrong with you. you you're just panicking. I mean, what do you think? Anxiety is designed to put you into something called fight or flight. So you run away or you fight. Mm-hmm. Now to do that, your body's got to be in the optimum condition to do that. 
So here's what happens. It's a lovely way to explain it to kids. When you get a bit anxious, your tummy starts to do that funny thing, doesn't it? Well, yeah. that's your bodyguard saying, oh, wait, there's something wrong. If you listen and move away, he'll stop. If you don't, he'll keep it going. What's actually happening is the blood's leaving your stomach and going into your arms and legs so you can run or fight because your stomach apparently is useless if you're under attack. I'd argue mine's very useful because it's quite big now, thanks to COVID. <laughs> it's huge. And what do you notice? You might get a bit sweaty. Well, that's your muscles warming up. Your heartbeat going faster. It's pumping that blood into your arms and legs. A bit breathless taking on more oxygen to make that blood oxygenated so you can run or fight a bit stiff that's because you're tense but here's the thing the last thing that happens is the blood's taken away from the part of your brain that allows you to think clearly because it doesn't want you to it wants you to run or fight so then you get this brain fog now if it was something physical say an axe murderer walked in here right now me being a therapist i'd probably try and talk him down but most people would run away or fight and the moment they've moved from that danger all those chemicals that are causing this reaction, anxiety, leave your body, you feel exhausted, but you're okay. But if it's emotional, if we're worried about COVID, worried about our loved ones, worried about our safety, feeling helpless, you can't run away from it. Mm. So consequently, those chemicals can't leave your body. So I would say 90% of us at the moment are walking around with an anxiety level that, oh, we hide it, we cope, we get on, but it's there. Chemicals give you the power to lift a damn car off someone. So imagine what they're doing to your body. They're exhausting mm. you. You won't sleep. Your immune system will get hit. Taking deep breaths, does that help? Yes. And the reason that it helps is the same reason that when a baby's crying and you pull a funny face or wave a rattle, you're interrupting the pattern. You can't feel two emotions at once. So just taking a deep breath, you're focusing on doing the breathing. While you're focusing on that, you're not focusing on the anxious feeling. It interrupts the pattern. Like dominoes, they can't go. It's exactly the same as a baby's rattle on all emotions. You can't, you can't be really angry and laugh. Can't do it, can you? You know, I've just said something that's made me think. It's just a, a little thing, but a big thing. When you said you can't have two emotions at once. I mean, to me, I felt happy and sad and weepy and and all kinds of stuff all at the same time. That's what oh, I'm yeah. thinking. Combine them. I, I have happy tears. Mm -hmm. I can be so sad when I'm watching a movie, but it's so beautiful it makes me cry. That's a different kind of sadness, isn't it? That's a whole different thing. It's a different form of empathy. But you can't be angry and really, really sad and grief stricken and laugh at the same time. You can flip between the two. So if somebody's in a really bad place, you can make them laugh and for a second they'll feel better. And then they'll bounce back into the overpowering emotion. Mm. Breathing, things like that just interrupt the pattern. The art is you have to keep interrupting it for it to go away or you need to acknowledge it. Grief, grief's a massive one, especially yes. with kids. Yes, yes. But how did you start working with children? I, well, I never used to because I don't have kids of my own. My, my sisters have got kids. And then a lovely lady um, that I was working with for anxiety brought her son along and said, sort him out. He's angry like his dad. And she left me alone <laughs> with this little man who was only about seven in his football kit who didn't want to be there. And I thought, I have no idea what to do. And that was with all my other recognised training, CBT, play therapy. And I, to this day, I'm, we've talked about this before. I'm not religious. I'm getting very spiritual. I don't know what happened. I just started tapping my foot and I said, I know I'm angry when my foot starts to tap. So I think the part of me, I later called the emotion superpowers, the part of me that angry must live in my sock. He runs up my leg into my eyebrow because my eyebrow goes up. <laughs> and if that happens, get out of the way. And all I did was, what about you? How do you know? And he went, I don't know. Well, you must know how you're getting angry. I don't know. And I just kept on him a little bit, not for long. This is the first session, not 10 months of blimmin' therapy. And he went, I don't know. And I just went, turned my back on him and went, oh, wow, you are angry. Is he always this angry? Is it just because mum brought you here? The kid didn't know where to put himself. He thought I was a complete nutter, and arguably I am. And I just said to it, are you making, his name was Peter, are you making Peter angry because mum makes him, he was wearing football kits, so I was just asking questions that I knew I'd get a no to. Mum makes you go to ballet. Peter's like, no. No, it's not that. No, okay. Are you making Peter angry because his mum makes him wear pink lycra? No. I think I asked four or five stupid damn questions that I got mm. a no to. And Peter got so cross with me. First session. This was within an hour, not months. Peter went, he's angry because he doesn't want to be the big boy. Kept my cool. I wanted to have a bit of a dance. What, what does he mean, Peter? And Pete explained to me he's got a little brother with additional needs, being poorly. Everyone that comes to the house has homed in on him. That's why mum's stressed. And once too often, Peter had just gone, mum, mum. And mum had said, Pete, please, I need you to be the big boy. What did he hear? Oh, I'm not special enough. I'm not loved enough. I'm not this enough. He didn't know how to voice that. 
So yeah. the way you voice it was anger. If you've got parents listening, all behaviour serves a par- purpose in kids and us. What you see, the behaviour, if you think about a tree, the behaviours are branches. Most therapy will deal with that. If you're lucky, they might change the behaviour after a few months. But if you don't get to the root of what's driving that behaviour, the emotion, you've had it. And, of course, kids couldn't voice emotions. So that's where the superpowers and the parts of you came from. And it's just gone mental. But it's so simple. Well, yeah, it, it sounds that way, especially the way that you put it. And is this where Ollie comes in? How did Ollie begin? Do you know, I don't know. Everyone says, where does Ollie come from? And and obviously I wrote some books. In the beginning, there was just me. So I wrote some books, which are just a fun story, kind of explaining this, but not a self-help book. So the kids would want to get involved and be part of it. And the name Ollie came up. The only thing I can think of is at the time, my young nephew had his first son called Ollie. So that, that was it. We became Ollie and his superpowers. So tell us about Ollie and his superpowers. What does he do? And I know that he's progressed from a book. So tell us more. <laughs> So the, the company name now is Ollie and his superpowers, and we have a really cute doll called Ollie, which the kids love because he's he's an anchor. By an anchor, I mean something that when they're cuddling him, they're thinking about what I've said and what I've taught them rather than maybe being angry or upset. So it's another pattern interrupt. The books really help parents and kids to take on what we're talking about and use it themselves because we don't want to sit in our ivory towers with we're therapists, we know what to do. And the whole concept's just been, as I said, picked up by schools. We're in schools all over, foster and adoption. Those kids have got so much going on. Uh, alternative provision, the kids nobody knows what to do with. But we don't just work with the kid, we work with the whole family because sometimes the reason the child's anxious is because mummy's, you're a protector. If you're anxious, the kid's going to be anxious. And I can't tell you why, it's just they don't feel safe. So it's important that we work with everybody and that we have one language. So we're all talking about emotions and superpowers so that the kids are not getting mixed messages, which happens in a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. And people always say to me, oh, that's great for kids. What about what about teens? Well, we don't change the model. We just change the language very quickly. There's a school in London. Teacher said to me, can I deal with can you have a chat with this lad? Teenage lad came in. He was a big unit. okay, and he had anger issues. So even I was a bit. Oh, and I said, you're right, weren't you? It says on your form, you've got a problem with anger. And he went, I ain't angry. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) Okay, mate. No, no. A teacher's written this down. Obviously, we look at things and we put a label on it. How would you describe throwing chairs at teachers and spitting at them? And he went, I get vexed, didn't it? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I am so old to this day. I do not know what he meant, apart from maybe he couldn't marry his kids off to Darcy and Bingley and Pride and Prejudice. But the key is I didn't need to know. So I ripped his form up that said angry and I put vexed in it on the top. (laughs) And we pulled vexed out and me and him dealt with vexed and worked out why vexed was so vexed. Oh, that's wonderful. But, you know, you do that for others. What about you? How do you deal with your anxiety? Oh, 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 oh. (laughs) (laughs) Therapists never have any problems. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Do you know what? I, I walk the walk, I talk the talk. We use the same thing. It's very hard to do it on yourself, to separate it from yourself. But as I said, we train mums and dads. We've got therapists all over the country now. And all of us are in supervision. Some training schools, you're in supervision for a little while and off you go. No, you know, the kids we're dealing with, we get horror stories. So we've got to be able to protect ourselves. And yeah, I come out of my therapy room some nights and I just want to drink Mm -hmm. because I can't heal the world. And that's Mm -hmm. not my job. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in supervision. Um, Other Ollie coaches around me, they'll, they'll take one look and go, Come on, girl, what's going on? You know, yes. and we'll yeah. kind of look after one another because if we lose the plot, then, you know, we're, we're like the pilot and the client's the co-pilot. Client gets upset, pilot takes over. If the pilot's upset too, plane goes down. So we have to keep that barrier. But it's tough, we're human. Yeah, no, I, I could imagine so, you know, because I've just uh, come back from St. Lucia where my parents are yeah. fully. Although I was there, you know, working, um, when I was indoors, it was more about, you know, being with my parents. And oh. it was very hard because I've trained as a counsellor, but I've not practiced for many, many years. So I don't call myself one. But it was very, very hard to, I wouldn't say separate myself because I'm, I'm always going to be the child. But <laughs> when I think about, you know, dealing with it with strength, and then coming away from it. And then I talk to myself as a person and then the counselling training to try and balance it to make me feel, and it's terrible. And sometimes I think to myself, I think it's a mixture of anxiety and sadness and being the eldest child and all that. But sometimes I think to myself, I want to cry. I want to cry. But the the tears are not coming. I say all this because sometimes I see in children's faces, they look so sad. And I just wish that they would cry. That's 
something we do as adults is we look at a situation and we can't help but project onto it. So we'll look at our teenagers and go, don't do that. I did that. I know what's going to happen. I know what you're feeling. We do that and it's out of love and compassion. But if somebody's not crying, does that mean they're not feeling or that they'd feel better to cry? Maybe it's just something they don't do. And there are other people that struggle with it. So everybody deals with their grief differently. And, you know, actually working close with family and friends, I I do. And that is harder because I'm, you know, I'm not a therapist all the time. I'm, I, I make the point of being Ali. And, and, and taking off the armour, if you like. But it's tough because whether it's a family member or a friend or somebody I've never met before, I really damn care as I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I know, and this is what keeps me sane and how I train our therapists, we're not there to give advice or fix because any advice we give is based on our take on the world. For example, have a good cry, you'll feel better. It might not be what they need. But we can only do so much and we have to accept that limitation. But we sleep at night because we know we've given our all. And provided you've done that, then I don't think anyone or anything can ask for more. Giving me something to think about there. Holly, how does our metaphor, the apple doesn't fall far (laughs) from the tree, pertain to you? To me, it's an interesting one. As a therapist, absolutely. Everything that we are is because of our environment, where we were born, what we learned, things we were brought up with. You know, we all love football because dad did till we hit the teen years and then we kick against it. Are we doing it to hurt dad? No, we're just finding our own way. So I think it's really important. It's a nurturing thing, isn't it? That we we do have this. This is my world, according to mum and dad, which is the tree. And if I stay near to it, then everything makes sense because they're teaching me and it makes sense to me because I, that's all I know. It's when we start to roll away from it, which we either do later on in life because we can't we don't fit under that tree anymore for any reason we don't always agree with everything that we've grown up with or as I said in my case you're encouraged to move away from the tree because you didn't fit on the tree in the first place and an interesting thing and again I I love this because a lot of the kids I work with have been hoofed away from the tree for one reason or another they're not smart enough they're not the right anything Yeah, everything that we don't want to get into on this show but all those reasons the things that make us different those kids are alone The idea of falling near the tree is you have the protection of the family in the shade of the tree. You're safe from the weather and whatever life throws at you. If you roll away from that tree, you're not. You're a sapling with no defence. Now, one or two things happen. You shrivel up and die or you become strong and you become resilient. And the tree you grow into is strong and resilient. But it doesn't turn you away if you're not an apple. I'd say I'm that one. Nice. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You've given me another thing to think about. Uh (laughs) One day, you know, you could never tell because, you know, when you started off and you you had Ollie and you couldn't imagine that you are in a really great place now. So tell us, you know, what's in the future? What's coming up? What are you planning, I should say, for your future? Well, Ollie's getting huge. So um, the first thing we've had to do is to look at, I'm Ollie's heartbeat, but I'm also the reason Ollie could fall over because there is only me. So we've had to look at, you know, how we grow Ollie, how we, the Ollie coaches that are joining us are from every walk of life. And and what can they bring into the team to take Ollie on so that I can step back a bit so it's not reliant on me. So mm-hmm. that's that's probably key. Going into international is quite key to us now. And as, as you know, COVID was a bad thing. It really hurt us, but it meant we had to put everything we were doing online. I still prefer face to face, but we can can do it online and effectively, including our training courses. So we can train people all over the world to do what we do. Mm. How cool. But I guess the most exciting thing this year is um, last year we were talking to a lovely company called Adorable Media who wanted to make the Ollie books into a cartoon. Mm. Fun cartoon, but a cartoon that at the same time as it being fun and interesting is actually putting that message out there about the superpowers and that you can be in control of your emotions. Backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. I've never done anything like this before. We finally agreed contracts. So we're going to start. They've made me an associate producer. Ooh. Oh, nice. Woo-hoo. I, I know. I know. I'm, I'm like, well, hey. I don't know what it means. I think it means I make them tea, but that's okay. Um, But it does mean I can keep my hands on the model and make sure that as much as they're doing the animation, it sticks to the therapeutic thing behind it. Putting that together to put um, a pilot together to, to throw out a load of TV companies. And you know what? If that happens, I will be so happy because the one thing we haven't got is a big, big company behind us and we're at the point now where we're looking for that so that we can get out and let everybody know we're here so you're not waiting months for your child I've, honestly right I've got kids that mum knew they needed help because mums do and six months ago they had low level anxiety now they're self-harming because they couldn't get near a damn therapist I want to change that and I can only change that if we can get it out which mm. is why I'm so grateful to you for just standing by us and doing this with us it's the least I could do and I just oh I, I just know it's gonna it's gonna you work you said that to me when we met and I didn't yes. think going to happen and I'm not going to be surprised one day if you know I get a message from you saying I need to talk I need to talk and then you tell me 
But, you know, it's been just so wonderful talking to you. How mm. can uh, people contact you, whether they want to consider being a, a coach, trainer, or yeah. how, how do they get in touch with you? Well, we have a website. It's called www.ollieandhissuperpowers.com. We're on most of fo- social media. And and you know what? If you're worried about your kids, if you're worried about yourself, teen, whatever, pick the phone up, speak to one of us. There's no charge for that. We have this thing. You might not like us. That's fine. We won't take offence. But we want to change the world. So please do. And if you're considering a career change, do it. Honestly, I've got hairdressers. I've got bus drivers. I used to blow buildings up for goodness sakes. Legally, I can teach you how if you've got that why in your heart. And we need more of you. So please. Oh, well, Ali, it's been a pleasure as usual. And I mean it when I say I'm waiting for that call. I mean it. (laughs) I know it's going to come. You're doing such amazing things for so many people. It's not just Ollie, you know, it's you. And without you, there's no Ollie. And so please keep your strength there. Keep your loved ones close and, you know, just stay safe and healthy. I will. And thank you so, so much. And it's lovely, lovely to see you looking so well, too. What a fantastic guest. I think it's fascinating seeing how we can teach kids to be more in touch with their feelings. I'm sure you'll agree that it can only make them more ready for the world as they grow up. Now let's get back to our metaphor of the week. Today's phrase often gets thrown around in a condescending way, especially in the entertainment world. It's used to taunt or belittle fictional characters. It describes how they will end up like their parents, with the narrative having explored a weakness or a trait, a bad one really, in a character's mother or father. It's a given that in any great story, the main character has in some way, shape or form experienced a downfall. A failure fails or falls, just like the apple falls from the tree. Using this idiom in dialogue can be a great way to foreshadow the issue while avoiding stating the obvious. TV shows and movies often give it their own twist when using the saying, such as in the 1996 movie Matilda. Sell me a lemon. You're heading for the chokey, young lady. Chokey? Teach you a lesson. What lesson? You and your father think you can make a fool out of me. My father? The guy with a stupid haircut. I don't like my father. You're the spitting image. The apple never rocks far from the tree. It's also heard in Batman Begins. To all of you, uh, all you phonies, all of you... <laughs> Two-faced friends, you sycophantic suck-ups who smile through your teeth at me, please leave me in peace. Please go. Stop smiling. It's not a joke. Please leave. The party's over. Get out. The apple has fallen very far from the tree, Mr. Wayne. Its use in these movies is perhaps why we use the phrase in a bad way more than a good way. Do you yourself use this phrase often? How would you use it in a sentence? We've focused somewhat on apples so far, but I think now would be a great time to look more towards the tree side of the metaphor. The apple tree, where our metaphor this week stems from, has its own little story. It has great meaning in ancient mythology, and it's recognized as the tree of love. This is in association with the goddess of love, Aphrodite. In Greek mythology, an apple tree was gifted to the supreme goddess Hera when marrying Zeus. So if you're ever struggling for wedding present ideas, there's a thought. Though I'm not too sure where you'd find fully grown apple trees to buy. So you'd need to look into that. Or you could even plant it now. And maybe it might be ready next Valentine's Day as an act of romanticism. The wild apple is the apple tree's first ancestor where all other apple trees are said to have derived from. Contrary to how you think, apple trees aren't commonly grown from apple seeds, but from a farming technique known as grafting. This is where the farmer takes a flower from an apple tree and merges it with a slice of the tree's body to replant it wherever it needs to be. It's somewhat symbolic that the apple doesn't rot far from the tree. The seeds become a new tree, but it is shown a different walk of life by someone else. If you ever did biology at school, you would have learned that plants reproduce by pollination. But the apple tree's genes do not abide by the same reproduction system. Now, the question is, how would an apple tree produce apples on its own? 
The answer is that for an apple tree to grow, it requires a different species of apple to be within 50 yards or so for it to successfully produce apples, still of course needing a bee or two's help with pollination. Do you remember being taught that at school? You know what? I don't remember being taught that. And I know I listened. Anyway, we could finish today's episode talking about family trees and the tree of life, but I think we get the gist. Instead, let's finish with a Clint Eastwood clip, maybe a bit more melodic than you were expecting. But if you know anything about his son, Kyle, you might not be too surprised. I talk to the tree, but they don't listen to me. I talk to the stars, but they never hear me. The breeze hasn't time to stop and hear what I say. I talk to them all in vain. I think it's fair to say, whether we like it or not, sharing at least one similarity or a dozen with your mom or dad is inevitable. If you feel being compared to your family members is a huge compliment and it leaves you with a great feeling, then great. On the other hand, if being defined under your family's qualities doesn't appeal to you, then don't let it define you. It's not impossible to change and turn your weaknesses into strengths, but for the most part, don't let someone else's comparison bring you down. You are who you are, and if you want to change that, make sure it's for yourself and not for someone else. We all have to come from somewhere. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Metaphorically Speaking. We hope you learned something new. I know I learned a lot and I also went back into my childhood to see whether I had been taught that and I couldn't find it anywhere and I hope that you found it somewhere when you were growing up. But anyway, don't forget, if you'd like to suggest a metaphor for an upcoming show, you can reach us at colorful.com forward slash shows forward slash Delia and we'd love you to share the show with your friends or leave a review on colorful.com or on our podcast metaphorically speaking which is on apple spotify and all major streaming platforms please help us to grow we need you to comment we need you to subscribe and that way we can share more metaphors from around the world with you join us for another metaphor next week i'm delia delore keep safe goodbye <laughs>